last speaker is Cristina Santa Emilia. You can skip the bio. No, I'm going to read the bio. Um, Cristina Santa Emilia is a PhD student at the University of Valencia. They hold a BA in English and an MA in Language and Literature Research, and they are currently pursuing a degree in art history. Their doctoral thesis examines the device of the tableau vivant and its implications in the neo Victorian novel. Their research interests center around intermedial and interartistic phenomena, particularly in the context of neo Victorianism. For the first edition of this conference, that is last year, uh, they presented a paper proposing a post humanist reading of Angela Carter's Night at the Circus. So, Cristina, welcome. Whenever you're ready. Thank you, Vicky. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Before I begin with my presentation, the last presentation of this conference, no pressure at all, uh, I would like to uh, to express my gratitude. I'll just take a minute. Um, I thank my brilliant supervisor, Laura Mendoz, for the organization of such a successful conference. <laughs> Alongside um, DG and Rosario, I also thank uh, everyone involved in the organization of this conference, all my colleagues backstage, making sure everything runs smoothly. And also, and I thank all, all of you, brilliant speakers, for your intellectual generosity. Um, now, um, I also want to apologize beforehand because I fear I will have to skip some of the quotes in the slides so as to meet the time limit, okay? Um, this uh, paper presentation bears the title of Speaking Painters and Silent Stunners, Re-Envisioning and re embodying the Pre-Raphaelite Muse. It is very much a work in progress that is tangentially related to my doctoral research. Um, and this paper presentation was motivated by the underexplored ubiquity and persistence of the Pre-Raphaelite legacy in Neo-Victorianism declared by literary critic uh, Helen Victoria Murray in 2008, uh, 2018, sorry, one of the most significant omissions in the field of Neo-Victorian studies. Um, but work is on the way. And only last year in a conference organized at the University of Malaga, which I did not attend, unfortunately, um, Neo-Victorian studies scholar Anne Hyman gave a conference which explored the representation of Elizabeth Sidal in Neo-Victorian culture across uh, different media. Because frankly, the material, the wealth of the material is spectacular. But um, out of all of those materials, uh, I've chosen to focus on the novel, the New Victorian novel. And um, these are the ones I have selected and read for this presentation, with the ones at the top being fictional biographies of uh, Elizabeth Sidal, or in the two middle cases, other pre Raphaelites, and the ones at the bottom being either um, novels in which uh, Elizabeth Sedala's historical personage uh, figures prominently on the one hand, and on the other, what Marie Louise Kolke in a 2013 article referred to as gloss biofiction, uh, works about made up characters modeled after historical subjects, famous historical subjects, Elizabeth Sedala in this case. Um, I am sure that all of you are familiar with Elizabeth Sedal, um, artist and muse of the Pre-Raphaelites and uh, wife of Dante Gabriel Rossetti. And I hate to have to introduce a woman as wife of, but this is relevant biographical information here. And um, although the painting in this slide is not probably the one from which you recognize her, this is her self-portrait. Um, in the dust jacket of Lucinda Hoxley's 2006 uh, biography of Elizabeth Sedal, one reads, and I quote, even those who do not know Mrs. Sedal's name will recognize her face. Her image is recognized the world over as the incarnation of the Pre-Raphaelites, unquote. So uh, Sedal is a cultural icon whose face uh, most people recognize, but whose name is a Sedal with one L, two Ls, mm -hmm. and whose history uh, beyond a couple of sensationalized anecdotes uh, most ignore. But, so the paradox that emerges from the um, ubiquity of her image on the one hand and the uncertainty or incompleteness of her history on the other um, invites retelling and myth-making and um, holds great allure for neo Victorianism, um, especially when we consider how uh, visual and voyeuristic neo Victorianism is, how um, when we consider this uh, desire of neo Victorianism to revisualize and bear witness to the Victorian era through its most recognizable icons. 
Not for nothing does Cora Caitlin identify scopophilia, the pleasure in looking, as a defining characteristic in biographilia or biography fetishism. Um, I think I will skip this slide and come back to it at the end, so bear with me. Um, now, I did say earlier that Elizabeth Tidal's portrait was probably not the painting from which you recognize her, uh, but these uh, two very tragic paintings, genre, Millais's Ophelia, and Dante Gabriel Rossetti's Beata Beatrix, probably are. Um, you see, uh, the allure that Elizabeth Tidal holds for neo-Victorianism rests largely on the tragic, uh, morbid, and sensational aspects of her life and afterlife. Um, Neo-Victorianism, a movement haunted by ghosts and revenants, a field dominated by the metaphors of haunting and spectrality, um, cannot but feel a fatal compulsion towards Elizabeth Tidal, a beautiful woman who died young in what most consider a case of suicide, and who was literally disinterred six years after her death when her husband, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, uh, wished to recover the book of poetry, which, in a grand melodramatic gesture, he had buried with her. Um, so her death and exhumation are so sensational that they have become the main events of Elizabeth Tidal's life. Um, this leads John Marsh, uh, this is a uh, main biographer, <laughs> to declare that, quote, um, Elizabeth Tidal's story really began not with her birth, the date and place of which long remained unknown, but with her death in 1862, unquote. In general, uh, in New Victorian fiction, uh, you know, Victorian retellings of her life uh, solidifies Sadal's characterization as this figure of tragedy, loss, and absence, and always overemphasize the traumatic and dismal aspects of her life, uh, such as childhood trauma, laudanum addiction, suicidal tendencies. Um, it is not only that every novel in my corpus leads theologically to uh, Elizabeth's demise as meaningful conclusion, but that all the novels in my corpus uh, make of it a main motif. Um, as in this uh, second quote from Elizabeth Savage's Willow Room, and I quote, Oh, who knows the truth, how she perished in her youth, and like a queen went down, pale in her royal gown. A year later, Christina wrote those lines, though she would never say whom, if anyone, she had in mind. But if she meant Elizabeth Sedal, uh, she erred, for the reign of that sad queen was just beginning. End quote. Um, this excerpt, which um, emphasizes the weight of uh, Sedal's posthumous uh, life, is just one of the many examples of the foreshadowing and anticipation of her uh, demise throughout all the novels. But um, do you allow me to touch on this briefly? Um, in most of the novels in my corpus, this um, iconophilic and voyeuristic desire directed at Lisa Sedal and her characterization as a death-bound figure of tragedy are expressed through constant uh, references and recreations of Milesa's Ophelia. You know, the famous anecdote of Elizabeth Tidal um, freezing while posing for Milesa inside a bathtub is taken as emblematic of her life, of her afterlife, and of pre-Raphaelite patriarchal gender politics. In fact, the conflation of the character of Yulia and the person Elizabeth Sedal is so strong that in two of the novels in, in my corpus, uh, well, two of them bear the former's name, Rita Cameron's Sophia's Muse and Sophia Bennett's Following Ophelia. And in the two first novels of that second set of novels, which are in fictional biographies of Elizabeth, um, Molly Hardwick's The Dream Damsel and Fiona Mountain's uh, Pale as the Dead, Sidal looms large uh, because they both relate sensational murders or attempted murders in which the victim is costumed and posed as a malicious Ophelia. And um, just uh, for time constraints, I will skip to the uh, second to last quote in this slide, the one from Following Ophelia, which is admittedly one of the most iconic and um, anachronistic novels in my corpus, which, will, which nonetheless surprised me with this. Um, iconoclastic observation, iconoclastic uh, in the sense of um, negating the invocation of the iconic. So um, the protagonist, the red-headed pre-Raphaelite muse, um, is uh, thinking about a poor country girl named Mary who was found dead in a stream, and uh, notice a constant negation, I quote, um, she, she thought of the Ophelia picture, but imagine the scene nothing like it, 
no delicate flowers floating, no fairy tale dress, no hallucinating artistry, unquote. And related to that, in these novels, I identify a very interesting uh, tendency to parody or subvert pre raphaelite uh, principles, or rather to parody the paradoxes that emerge from contrasting those uh, principles with the ugly truth or historical effective um, reality. One such paradox is that uh, which springs from the pre raphaelites simultaneous uh, rejection of formulaic templates in art and on the one hand, and uh, their composite uh, repetition or reinscription of certain formulaic uh, figurations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, womanhood on the other. In the constant uh, projection, role-playing, role-casting, and conflation of the sitter or muse, in this case, Elizabeth Tidal, and the characters uh, she's made to portray and embody, I read a testament to the, to the um, plasticity of this cultural icon and an awareness of the elusiveness and constructed or even palimpsestic nature of this biographic subject which emerges from the crossroads of fact and fiction, um, embodiment and uh, textualization. Now, I could present you with dozens of other fragments in the novels in which Lizzie or the characters modeled after her are cast and addressed to as, aside from Ophelia, uh, as Beatrice, Gloria, Princess Ida, Viola, etc. But I want us to turn to this last quote uh, from Ophelia's muse, in which Rossetti tells Lizzie, quote, um, for the next exhibition, I will submit a painting of you, of you as the fair Beatrice. You, Mrs. Idol, will be the face of the new British art, end quote. And I single this quote out because it encapsulates the paradoxical nature of pre raphaelitism regarding womanhood. So woman is the face of the masculinist pre raphaelite brotherhood, um, the metonymy of their aesthetic principles. Um, as Cherry and Pollock argue, in the literature on the pre raphaelites women functions as a sign, as symbol, as a cipher of masculine creativity. And in no case is that as evident as in that of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, um, an artist whose reputation is owed largely to the exploitation of his muse's beauty, uh, to the point that his different models and lovers helped to periodize his error, as I believe is reflected in Elizabeth Savage's um, choice to structure her fictional biography of Rossetti, Willowwood, into three parts after the women in Rossetti's life, so Lizzie, Janie, and Fanny. Um, now, before time runs out, allow me to turn to what was to be the focus of my analysis. Uh, I've said before, Victorianism has a strong visual and scopophilic sensibility. And in the novels I am analyzing, concerned as they are with artistic legacy and iconography, um, I identify a strong tendency towards what uh, Professor Lurel has uh, term a pictorial saturation, which is basically an umbrella term to refer to the multiple invocations of the iconic in the textual from pictorialism to hypotyposis or ecclesis. And here we have a couple of examples. I'll just mention one of such um, figurations or references to the iconic in the novels, um, which in a way serve to reflect on the image's role in perspectivizing the past. Um, so aside from the multiple references and descriptions of paintings in the novel, we have quotes such as the second, um, and I quote, uh, the moon made a few bushes and early flowers look rather like one of uh, the steel engravings, gray, deeply mysterious, yet every contour clear, end quote. Um, so let us turn now to see how uh, the news fits into this iconophilic tendency. Um, so uh, Cherry and Pollock already mentioned, uh, argue here that in the critical literature of the pre raphaelites woman is read as image, as an explicitly visual image. And in my selection of novels, I interpret in the contrasting uh, characterization of the pre raphaelite uh, male artist and the muse or model, a staging of a gendered ekphrastic encounter. What I mean by this is that in these novels, perhaps engaging with that sister arts tradition and those intersemiotic transfers of the pre raphaelites which um, Carolyn Radcliffe already mentioned um, on the first day of the conference, um, in these novels, there is an invocation of the paragonal struggle between word and image, uh, a dialectic that is read in gender terms by James E. W. Heffernan when he describes ekphrasis, that is, the visual representation of verbal. 
um, sorry, the other way around, <laughs> the verbal representation of visual representation as, quote, a duel between male and female faces, the voice of male speech striving to control a female image that is both alluring and threatening, unquote. Of course, this argument is not meant to be read in an essentializing uh, light. It's a rhetoric figuration that is meant to describe the framing or circumscription of um, women codified as image within this uh, mythopoetic and geographic narrative of pre-Raphaelite history. A figuration which can be linked to the theoretical metaphors of the voice and the gaze, you know, both powerful metonymies of social agency. Um, as we see in this uh, two quotes at the middle of the slide, uh, the muse, pretty as a picture, is insistently characterized by two-dimensional stillness, stasis, and silence. In opposition to the dynamism, productivity, and, and um, authoritative discourse and gaze of the male artist. The contrast between the muse's uh, picture-like stasis and the dynamism of the artist is highlighted in fragments such as these ones, and I quote, um, Rossetti is unusually energetic, almost athletic in his movements. He has been in the room for 10 minutes and not spoken, unquote. And here, and I quote again, um, she could not imagine his face stationary like a portrait, but her mind recreated the sense of his quick movements and the feeling he gave of adding vitality to everything that surrounded him, unquote. And here in the, in the last quote I'm mentioning, um, I had written about her in my first poems and romances. She answers the description, you invent her or imagine her, she appears, unquote. Here we can read a meditation on this clash between, between the authoritative or authorial, follow the centric, if you will, um, male speaking subject and the alluring but insidious to be looked at a uh, female subject object that is made to respond to his narrative. And before I do exceed the time limit, um, after an analysis in which I have tried to briefly sketch the mechanisms um, of biographic revisualization of the pre-Raphaelite muse Elizabeth Sidal in uh, New Victorian fiction. Let me just return to the slide which I skipped earlier. Um, this one. And um, perhaps in lieu of a proper conclusion, uh, let me draw attention to the metaphor Jan Marsh uses to describe Liz's afterlife as a cultural icon, that of a soft clay pot constantly shaped and reshaped and filled with new meanings. A very visual metaphor which aptly describes the endeavor that has brought us all here together, um, the examination and interrogation of the various shapings and reshapings, stagings and restagings of the 19th century. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your kindness. You have a couple of minutes left. <laughs> right. So um, now it's the time for uh, questions, comments. Do we have any question or comment from the? Yeah. Thank you. All right. And over there. Yeah. Let's start over. No, no. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. Good luck. Um, uh, I have a question for you, but also just to offer Dina and perhaps Christina as well. Um, are you familiar with the work of Graham Dykstra, who's an American an artistic uh, critic and historian? Uh, there are two books, Idols of Perversity and Evil Sisters, that look respectively at Victorian art and an early film uh, in terms of uh, the construction of the feminine with regard to the Victorian male anxieties. Um, and I'm happy to write that name down for you if you want. Um, but uh, you know, I was wondering, I'm a child of the 90s, uh, which means I came up through Heroin Chic and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And I was wondering if you've done any thinking about how the female vampires and indeed then the female non vampire heroines in that relate to the thinking you're doing about the anorexic body. Uh, so thank you for, for your question and your comment. Um, I'll ask you again about the uh, books because um, sure. <laughs> thank you. So um, truth is, I haven't given much thought to to it because, as I said, it's a very recent yeah. uh, topic for me. Um, I have been working with the Gothic and horror and vampires and etc., but uh, not in this like context. And um, anorexia is like a 
like any topic for me. Uh, but yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, yeah. So uh, I'm also a huge uh, fan of uh, 90s uh, vampire uh, fiction. So of course, thank you so much for, for your comment. Um, so first, um, thank you for you know, the panel. It was very, very interesting. You know, I was thinking how much the creators are very consciously tapping into this kind of Victorian trend by calling Vicky Victoria and also playing into the red hair. I was thinking about a rich vampire and a red-headed woman, but also kind of what I like was this, the full body, the full lips, yeah, obviously, um, the inside. I was thinking that when I saw, you know, sensuous, very much connected to commonality, and then thinking about our feeding and self-deprivation as a way of stopping one's bodily urges, Connected to Caroline and her very conspicuous brain hair, and it reminded me of Pablo Market. And again, this composition of the red headed and the wind is like really tapping into that um, kind of a polycystic imagination of all these pictures. And then for Christina, I was wondering um, the study the pendants and the wonderful. Um, Parallel because we uh, talking about how we seem to be the same person. Again, we say we are vampire um, the moose. And if we think about Saddam, even in such a position as the capital, it's a position. She presents herself, for example, as the lady of Charlotte. She kind of clears the space of him and everything that reminds us of him. And in this painting, uh, where she presents herself, she is arranging all these traces that we have come to associate with resistance vision with himself. So, couldn't we establish these parallels in between first person presentation of herself and third person and how we apparently does not submit? This use and abuse of, of her. Perpetuating, yeah. Yeah, perpetuating the same thing. Uh, thank you, Miriam, for your comments, for your questions, and your interest. Um, yes, I do. I have considered that. And the thing is that most of the novels are in the third person, and even the ones which are only a couple of them, which do use the first person, do not manage to like uh, actually subvert this iconophilic voyeuristic tendencies because in one of them, which is Ophelia's muse, um, you know, I was mentioning uh, the Ophelia trope in picture and this necrophilic case it invites. Um, so in this novel that for once uses the first person, she, um, Lizzie uh, has these dreams in which she is Ophelia. So in a way, it's this compulsive uh, repetition of the stereotypes associated to her as a fatal figure uh, to be read through the narratives we have of her. So it's a bit disappointing in that sense. So yeah, but thank you for your question. Oops. Uh, so again, thank you for your question. As always, uh, your feedback is really um, eye-opening. Um, so yeah, I think the creators are very much aware of 19th century um, legacies of, of the um, vampire, uh, because actually the uh, two main protagonists, the uh, male vampires, are uh, 19th century um well, a 19th century American uh, man, uh, one of them fought in, in the Civil War, etc. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think this Victorian um, aesthetic is present in the show. And yeah, I was also thinking about Goblin Market when I was uh, writing the paper. But the thing is, I, I didn't have time to include uh, everything. But in the case of uh, Vicky, for example, uh, she's represented as a temptress. Um, well, actually, she doesn't uh, really appear in many episodes because she's killed off 
pretty uh, early in the series. Uh, but she's uh, portrayed as a promiscuous character who had it coming in a way. So this uh, victim blaming uh, is present. And um, this fight between um, I have these urges and at the same time I have to like repress them. Um, so yeah, uh, I think um, it's it's there. And I think the creators are very much aware of this um, appropriation, I, I believe. But uh, of course, I don't know. I, I might have to interview them <laughs> to check. So thank you. You. Um, I've got a question and a comment, and I guess the comment is to to Dina. Um, uh, in, it's the first time we've we've met with comedy, and we were Victorian, and I thought that was quite interesting. And when we were going to reflect on that, but I know it's new for you. So, but my question is for Sarai. I mean, um, you gave us some pretty shocking statistics. Actually, I was quickly calculating. Um, and I think it's in the, um, uh, the Peter Hall era that it was 7.5% 7, 7 of the total, you know, it, and I think those numbers are, um, uh, not everything is quantifiable, but those numbers are instructive. Did you find, particularly in work on the earlier, the Olivier and Hall and Trevor Mann, did you find any commentary on... Um, particularly the, the involvement of, of, of women. Um, is there anything in the archival record of the National Theatre itself that they're aware that there's a huge problem? <laughs> um, uh, or is it just something that, because I mean, I guess both Olivia and Hall, and you know, you read Peter Hall's diaries and you realize that there was a, a massive Oedipal battle between those two. Um, uh, they're the great men of theatre, you know, the, the, it's still that kind of actor-manager hangover, but is there anything in the record of the National Theatre itself that that is at all self-aware? Well, this part of, of my research, uh, what I brought here is mainly done uh, by using the online, online catalogue uh, I'm not uh, going to the archive because, I mean, I can't. I... <laughs> okay, like. <laughs> um, but I've been reading and I've been trying to um, look for information, and I'm not going to say it's hundred percent reliable because after all, you're reading things here and there, little snippets in maybe interviews or articles hidden away, you know, like you know. Um, but I will guess that the, the time was something to, to be considered. You know, it's like the, the I don't know how to say it in a nice way. Uh, basically how people were raised mm. back then, the expectations, you know. Um, for Olivia, he trusted Joan Plowright a lot. He trusted her, for what I've read, um, really a lot. However, and and um, I've read that when she was appointed director of those uh, five plays, um, Lord Chandos was in a panic because he thought that it was the first step for John Plowright right, becoming Olivia's successors uh, as artistic director. And and the board was like, no way, that's not happening. Uh, that's for what I read. And then um, regarding Hall, <laughs> I think that's more delicate. Um, but uh, what I read is that there were not more women directing at the national because there were no good women directors. And it's like, well, you know, um, I think it was a very unfortunate comment from his part, you know, because um, I wasn't born back then, but I'm quite sure there were remarkable women directors back then as they are now. Um, so I think that's probably the 
misogynistic attitude of the industry back then had to, uh, to play, you know, had a role to play on, on those decisions. But again, I'm, I'm, I won't dare to say that this is 100% reliable information because I've not contrasted it, unfortunately, and how and Olivia cannot be consulted anymore. Uh, <laughs> you know, they cannot be interviewed. Um, unless I, I use a medium, we can do a sound. <laughs> but um, just to put a little bit of humor here. Um, so it's, it's not contrasted information. It's just what I could find here and there. So on the one hand, there's, there was a panic from the theater's board of having a female ruling the theater just because I don't know what they expected could happen. I don't know, destroy the theater or something. Yeah. And and then the attitude of the artistic director yeah. in particular. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much. There's three brilliant papers again. One's for me to end the day. Um, Christina, I, I was really interested to, to hear your conclusions um, in relation to kind of the afterlife of Sidney. And I don't know whether I made the point most effectively the other day, but um, my conclusion from the Tate exhibition was that the women were still defined through Rossetti through their relationship with Rossetti. And even though the Tate had tried to curate it to give those women a um, profile and um, representation, they still, they still appeared to be kind of disempowered and victims. And, which, which is why I thought Herbert wasn't really featured because it seems to be the only way still that we, we um, need to be working in, which is so disappointing, isn't it? Uh, thanks a lot for your comment, and yes, I totally agree, and that I think was also included, well, more or less, or hinted at in my conclusion, where they continue to be read through Rosetti's figuration of them, depiction of them, and uh, like codification, even art history has codified them through his eyes. Um, so, and it feels even frustrating the way it seems we cannot escape um, that codification, even if it's um, it, ha it has something to do with this um, iconophilic uh, pleasure that we derive from this legacy of the pre-Raphaelites, you know, that we just can't seem to uh, be able to contest, I guess. <laughs> but thank you. Right, so thank you very much. Our time is up.